All right, folks, welcome back to the Very Messy Workbench. We are going to get going with episode part number three of building the worst flanker ever, the Ravel 1989 release 172 Su 27 flanker. Um, in the last episode, we completed general painting, uh, trying a new technique and everything. I think it, it it's pretty good overall. Um, we they talked about in the last episode some things I would do different if I tried that this technique again where you prime the whole thing in black and then do the white squigglies and and stuff rather than my normal white priming and uh, pre-shading with, with black over the panel lines and everything. But yeah, cool. Um, if you missed that part and you'd like to check out that part, I'll do one of those thingies you do up here so you can check it out. But um, so I'm going to start this episode, this part, um, looking at this overall where we're at we've got we've got plenty more work to do but i decided to take a second because i have just been bashing the shape and the features of this one through an unboxing and then two build parts um, i wanted to grab a flanker that i would consider good now this is not finished at all and you can probably tell that just by looking at it this is a trumpeter j11 bravo this thing has been in a box for god knows how long it is unfinished it is beat up it's never going to be finished because I have no idea where the rest of the parts are. But the shape and lines on this are pretty accurate, including panel lines and, and all the dimensions and everything. And I thought we'd just take a second here to compare so that when I'm, I'm saying things like this is badly done, you know, we have a good frame of reference. And I think that we can all agree that the, the Trumpeter series in 172 is pretty good as flankers go. You know, so when we start off, we can compare them in terms of size um, you can see that it's it's off size uh, by by a noticeable amount all right and uh, the trumpeter one doesn't even have the pitot tube on it yet you can see the difference when we talk about the bulby nose and the more refined more aerodynamic shape on the nose on the trumpeter one looking at the the engine nacelles and the, the air intake it's very shallow here and um, you can see the much more pronounced intakes on a good one. Now, yes, this is, by the way, yeah, it's a J11 Bravo, and, and the J11 Bravo has some significant differences between it and a standard flanker, but most of those differences are just in materials and internals. In terms of shape, it is flanker. It is a uh, slightly different wingtip launch rail, but, um, you know, still it's, I mean... It is, it is pretty good. Um, you can see, like, one of the main things we're looking at here. Take a look at the way that the fuselage blends completely into what we call the stinger. You know, it is, it is one aerodynamically shaped piece. And then we have, I mean, no idea what is going on with this here. Um, of course, you know, any flanker ever... There is that the, the heating, the heat resistant panels, the anti heating panels are, are always metallic ish, and then the Ravel instructions tell us to just paint the whole thing. I don't have engine nozzles on it, I have no idea where they are, so I can't show you the very basic difference in detail, but I'm not even worried about that right now, you know. Um, wings are, uh, there's a little bit of a, little bit of a difference in, in the spacing between wings and uh, horizontal stabs there, but you know, it is what it is. Um, interestingly enough, I was looking at these little guys right here, and I was like, why are these fairings on here? And then I looked at them, and I was like, I know what these are. I know where they're supposed to be. These little fairings that they put on the vertical stabilizers for some reason, on a real flanker, they go by the landing gear. That, that's like the landing gears go there. They they help stabilize it. I don't know why they would put, why they decided they go on the, on the stabilizers. I don't know. And then, of course, you know, a regular flanker has perfectly hard, um, vertical... Uh, ventral fins and horizontal stabilizers, whereas Ravel had us mount them both on an outward cant for some odd reason, and I think it's because they had there was just more information on the MiG-29 available at this point than the uh, Su-27 when this kit came out. Speaking of, I've often said that this thing reminds me more of a MiG-29, and that has a lot to do with the, the wing fuselage shape there. So you see how there's a very abrupt change and the, the shape of the fuselage and the height and everything and the, the canopy, that is a very MiG-29 looking feature there. And if you look at a Su-27, I, I, this is what I've been trying to get at. It's very well blended in. And 
you can see definite differences in, in the real height and um, the extent to which the canopy bulbs outwards. Um, this look, and I have a MiG 29A that I'm that I'm working on that I've been working on. It's just been sitting for a little bit, and this is Italery. Um, not the greatest kit out there, but if you look, you can definitely see the MiG 29 influence in this flanker kit. If you look at the leading edge extensions and you look at how the fuselage comes up from it. You know, again, they were working, I guess, with the best information they had at the time. So yeah, you have a flanker shape overall, but you can really see that they just sort of put the best info they had at the time. You can really see that MiG-29 influence in here. Flanker shape, but not quite, not quite exactly the way the flanker is blended and built. Um, and that can if i had the canopy on the mig 20 on the, the mig 29 here you it, it also is the, the mig 29 canopy also has much more of a of a bubble up than the flanker does um, so yeah there's there's a lot going on um when we look at this this flanker versus right, oh, there goes our air brake a real flanker um, a correct flanker i should say um, and then there's there's other little details all throughout that i'm not gonna you know not gonna harp on um, but I mean like these wing folds, I don't know what that's about Because um, even if we were doing a Su-33, they would be much more inboard than over there I don't I don't know what that is for um, Like I said these pods instead of launch rails. They they don't quite look like ECM pods. They don't quite look like the actual launch rails on the wingtips of a flanker um, so I just thought I'd take a moment. Oh, and then they have this antenna, they call it an antenna, right here behind the canopy. Maybe they were talking about the pedo tubes that we see on flankers, on, on just about all flankers. And then, of course, these, these random dielectric panels that don't really go. The only dielectric panels that they actually got right are the ones on the top of this, the stabilizers. Um, I just managed to pull this off. Every flanker we ever see has panels in some way, shape, or form on the vertical stabilizer leading edge and this doesn't have it these things i don't know i don't know what they're supposed to be what they're supposed to look like although once again i will i will defer to the mig 29 you can't see them right now because they're not painted or shaded but the mig 29 has panels on the leading edge of the uh leading edge extensions you know so may i don't know maybe but i thought maybe we would we would start with kind of comparing the two since I found this in a box and I said what a great opportunity to just sort of point that out a little bit. So what we've got going on today, um, we've got to uh, white the landing gear areas, the landing gear bays and the area for our uh, interior of the air brake. We, we're going to position this one um, in, in action, opened up. We have weapons we have to do. I still have to touch up this little, this little drop of thinner or something that fell on it. Um, now, on a real flanker, an actual flanker, the insides uh, surfaces of the landing gear doors are red. Um, but again, I, I said I'm gonna I'm doing this one straight out of out of their instructions. You know, as as they say, we're gonna do this exactly as as they want us to. And the truth is, they're they're not very descript about stuff like that. They actually say olive olive green. They want they want us to paint the inside of well, they say paint the whole door olive green. And I have to assume that they're me that they mean the inside, and not and not the outside too, um, because that would just be fairly ridiculous. They actually don't tell us to paint the the gear wells anything, besides the same old color as the rest of the plane, but I, so I'm gonna go ahead and just do those white. Um, but the wheel, the, the, you know, the the wheels and the landing gear doors are gonna get olive green. I'm, I'm doing it according to the according to the instructions. I'm gonna have it done. At least the landing gear struts are gonna be white, like normal. And so um, they don't tell us what color to do the interior of the, of the air brake. Oh yeah, they do A, A, all right. And what is A? A is flat black. Okay, cool. Um, very interesting. And that is also flat black. Sounds good. Um, I'll tell you what though. Now, again, giving us no extra instructions, I would, I would kind of, it would make sense to me that Ravel, if they're have, this is already flat black. 
because I already painted it, so that's great. Um, I want to paint this white because they gave us this random fake detail. At least I could pick that out and do some detailing on there if I painted it white. I mean, I guess if it's black, I could paint it all like silver or something, but... Um, I'll paint it black if Ravel wants it black. Again, we're doing this all by Ravel standards. So let's get going. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure that all the missiles, all the weapons, they tell us to do in, in white at least. Yeah, all the, all the weapons are sort of kind of... No, not accurate at all. But we'll see how they go when they go. So I'm anticipating this will be the last um, the last part in the whole series of building this this flanker. So let's get to it. I think I will switch up the music in this one. So we'll go back to some cool uh, old school 8-bit stuff. Ready? Break! took something in the instructions when I was looking at color callouts. Um, I was just looking at letters but forgetting that some of these letters are the sprue and some of these letters are color callouts. Um, so there are no actual color callouts for the landing gear doors or interiors or the air brake or anything like that. There is for the piston. Um, but so yeah, so I kind of made a mistake on that. Uh, when I went back and looked, I realized that and so I figured I have a little leeway. I'm gonna do the interior of the brake itself in red um, and the interior of the, the uh, landing gear door in red and I, I gave him a base coat of white. Make it a little easier to do a nice, a nice good red color. Um, and the landing gears, they called for silver, just says silver. Um, so we've also got our, um, our Alamos done. And I decided that I was going to do just just because they came with the kit and to to do the kit are drag bombs. Um, we've only got, I believe, uh, six hard points on this thing. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, because we're missing some under the wings and we're missing the wingtip ones. Um, so we're going to do um, two radar guided, two infrared guided AA-10s, and then we'll do two drag bombs. Just... To, to use the weapons that come in the kit and really revel this thing out. With the white done, we can unmask landing gear bays. And I don't know if I mentioned this either. This is very much the the wrong shape for the one. There's, there's only one landing gear door for, for the forward and it swings this way. One that opens up like so, not four, cutting this little weird shape. Um, they almost got the shape for the um, rear gear bay doors correct, but not quite. Um, and it's almost, almost right. The sizing is a little bit wrong.
I was a little, I was a little sloppy intentionally doing the hoses and lines inside these bay areas because I'm going to give a nice wash to it and number one it's going to hide a little bit of that but I just wanted to give it I wanted to give it a pronounced look even though you're not going to see a lot of the interior there when it's all done because we're going to have this break there covering part of it but um, I just I wanted to make things stand out real well um, instead of just perfect little you know like the molded on detail um, and, and you'll see when I do the wash it'll 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 really just make it all kind of go together so now we're at the point where we can do a the first gloss clear coat on this and obviously that's going to be a nice acrylic coat so that we can um, do a little bit of enamel work let's talk about the weapons for a little bit again you know these are not first of all the radome tan should have gone. The radome should have gone on the radar guided ones, not the infrared ones. But I'm I'm doing this per the instructions. Like I said, just to reiterate. So this is what Ravel wants. This is what they're gonna get. I modified the pylons in the middle because these have nothing to to no slots to accept the tabs. So I just shaved them down a little bit. So I'll put the drag bombs in the center line between the nacelles, and then we will put the missiles um, on the other ones. So we got them. We're got our landing gear. You know, uh, I did a little extra, <laughs> more than what they said. They just wanted everything uh, silver, but I, I did it. I did. I, I, I sometimes I just can't stand it. I got to give it a little bit extra. Um, this is not the right Russian green, but they asked for all drab, so that's what I did. that we did so far we did with uh, green and brown by MIG I thought that would be a, a nice color not too strong not like black just BAM but just give us a little bit of grimy look uh, there is still some time before I'm ready to actually put decals on this airplane but I am still very curious as to how these decals are going to hold up now the easiest thing to do to be sure and safe would be to just give the whole thing a spray of decal film um, there's different ways to do it. There's actual decal film. I could just use a clear gloss lacquer. Now, now those have their own implications of, of using, but you know, the truth is I'm just really curious how these decals, as good as they look, are going to hold up. So, like I said, I'm going to test out using just one white star. And I'm going to cut it. And we're just going to put it in the water and we're going to see exactly how it holds up being as old as it is. Um, sometimes you can really see when old decals are just, for lack of a better word, expired. You can see when they're gonna crack up and be useless. Sometimes you can't. So this is gonna be really interesting to me just to see how good these, these decals really are. Now as it's moistening up, you can kind of see the carrier film around the decal itself which is a lot harder to see when it's when it's on the sheet before it's wet. I don't see any big signs of cracking. I see it's starting to peel off the paper. So I don't wanna I don't wanna stress this out at all. I don't want to peel it before it's ready. I don't want to do anything to it. So I'm just gonna give it a second and let it sit. Look at that. Now we've got some yellowing around the edge. 
which may persist or it may not, may go away once the decal is dried onto the surface of the plane. This decal from 1989, and that yellowing is, is so that's, that's not yellowing so much as the glue. That's the glue, and a lot of times when that happens, the glue will go transparent again when the decal dries. But we've got a decal from 1989 that's still in usable shape. So if I put it back on here, I should be able to use it, you know, again when this is ready. So these decals look good. Hopefully this one decal is is speaks reference to all of them, and we can just use these decals as they come. That's awesome. So I'm gonna get ready to to do the decals once this uh, this is dry to the touch, but I, I want to let it cure for a little bit more before I start messing with it. So it is time to actually do some decals. I decided um, there's not a lot of stuff to use for landmarking like I like to do when I do decals. So I'm going to start with the, the fives on the tails because I can kind of base off of that panel line there. So we're going to get those in the water and we're going to get going. And hopefully this is going to work out great. And if not, we'll just come up with a new solution. I've got plenty of extra decals. I'm sure I've got some. If these fall apart, we, we'll come up with a backup plan. I'm not sure what, but we will to as closely match the kit as we can. All right, let's let's get this decal on there. I can't believe these decals are in such good shape. For as old as they are. Now, something to be aware of. Um, these both are labeled BB, but they've got shadows that are different. And... Um, the instructions don't really specify which one, and I think I just put the wrong one on this side. So, glad I just looked at that real quick first. So, they're both BB, they're both the same marking number, but you gotta look at the shadow to make sure you're getting it right. And boy, am I glad I noticed that now rather than later. Oh, oh, this one tore apart. It's okay though. Looks like it's going back together okay. And if we can just get it positioned, it will be fine. So what I'm using is this panel line and the bottom of the carrier film to line it up right with the panel line. And then I'm using this panel line as a kind of a horizontal line to get it. I want it to be centered-ish. I think that works. So now we'll get the one on the other side and then we'll work on some, some red stars. All of these markings actually went pretty well for the most part. Um, the stars actually uh, under the wings started to fall apart a little bit. It's kind of like they knew <laughs> they're going to be the least seen ones so they can uh, break a little bit. But other than that, the, they went pretty well. Um, we've got the big Bort numbers, we've got the little Bort numbers, we've got the stars on the wings and on the verts. So now that those are all done, and I, you know, I did my standard, I did some Microsol, I did some Solvacet, they're pretty good, they held up. So now we just have these very few stencils to put on. The instructions um, don't get very specific about it. So we've got CC, we've got DD and EE, and they actually, so they do kind of lay out where they go. Yeah, yeah, they do. They they give you some, they, they point out that what they look like and then they just sort of have them laid out. They don't, they don't show where they all go, but you know, the, it'll work. So I'm gonna get the stencils on, 
to finish the decaling and then I really want to get the wheels installed. So let's take a look. Um, decals are going great. We're going great until we got to the stenciling and the stenciling wanted to fall apart on almost every single one. So I did the very best that I could. Um, some of them are better than others, but we've got We've got all the decals on. All the decals from the original decal sheet are on this aircraft, and I'm really happy about that because we didn't have to swap anything out. We're not missing anything. Everything is where it's supposed to go. Um, and I'm about to put on one more layer, one more coat of Solvacet to just get everything snuggled down. The decals, uh, you know, from again, 1989, responded really, really well to the Solvacet and the Microsol. Um, some of the stars, uh, you, you know, they broke up, but not all the way. Um, you know, they, they, they held together and I was able to very carefully with the tweezers, just sort of push them together and everything. The, the, the stenciling itself, though, broke up into pieces and I was able with, with a lot of patience to put it back together. Some of them were a little bit crooked though. I, like I said, I did the very best that I could, but this is, um, what we've got and take a look still too, because again, these decals are from 1989. Look at the carrier film. Look how clean it is. Look how clear it is. Um, you know, the, the, uh, you can slightly see it, but uh, there's no yellowing. They really snug down. I, I did slice around panel lines and stuff with, with the, um, the Exacto just to help them get in there. They're really good for 1989 i mean how old is that do the math i'll put it in text because i can't do math in my head like that but these are like 30 something 40 something year old decals from the box from the kit not even aftermarket and they they, they worked so now that that's done i can give a final um gloss coat i think people this is personal personal um preference i think if you if you spend time around real military aircraft especially high performance fighters they're not flat. They are, you know, for aerodynamics purposes, um, a lot of them are, well, if they're not maintained, they, the paint can, can weather and turn flat. But a lot of the times, they have a glossy sheen to them. I wouldn't do gloss, but I'm going to put a semi-gloss on everything because that's really kind of, you know, you want to keep them nice and clean and aerodynamically functioning. And uh, flat might work great for, like, low-altitude uh, ground attack stuff. But planes that are going to fly high and fast and, you know, there's math and science behind it. A, a glossier, cleaner plane flies more aerodynamically, burns less fuel, performs better. And um, so if you ever get up close and personal to a lot of these planes, they're not just a flat color. They, they also sometimes have a, a satin or a semi-gloss sheen. So that's what I'm going to do with this guy. I'm going to give it a, a semi-gloss coat after I seal all the, the, the work in one more time with one more coat of aqua gloss and then we can start assembling the last little bits and stuff to it and um it is you know what it is the detail speaking like i said worst flanker kit but it's been a labor of love and i can't wait to see what it looks like all finished up so let's get going there and we now have legs for it to stand on. Excellent. So let's get that in the corner and let's get that made it up right there and figure out exactly where it's going to sit. Hmm, it's not bad. And then I'll just take a toothpick and put some glue around the edges there. So, got our speed bay. That helps it a lot, look a lot more flanker-like. And just a little detailing underneath it really helps out a little bit. Um, so let's get some landing gear doors done. These landing gear doors are roughly right sort of shape wrong dimensions but kind of there's no actuators or anything that go to them they just sort of glue on um so i don't even know 
what this go like how this is supposed to go it has these tabs but they don't seem to go on to anything so this is going to be very interesting to sort of figure this out this one this guy at least fits into here but this one but this little piggy I guess you just what do you do with it well we'll figure it out in a second there's the one and of course we're gonna have to come back later and do the edges in the red um, this one though I'm trying to trying to figure out the way they want you to put it on because they don't really the pictures are not that descript of exactly how they want these doors to sit so I guess like this I guess they want I guess they want it to sit like that there's no oops there's no actual anywhere for you to it's just gonna get glued on like that that's phenomenal it doesn't make any sense because that would actually well whatever not a lot on this model does make sense so I'm just gonna glue it on the way that they and you can actually rest it there and it just misses contacting on the the air brake which is cool so I'm gonna do it the way that they're suggesting to do it a little bit of glue here a little bit of glue here on these little nubs <laughs> and let's see if I can uh, might not be able to get this entirely on camera but let's see if I can get this glued exactly the way that they want it done well that is what they're saying to do of course the doors overlap so okay though you know what have I said it enough worst flanker kit ever but that is that is what they that is how they go that is what they do got to be really careful when we touch this up because there is so little contact between the pieces over there with the glue but there we go so I'm gonna do the other side and then we'll talk about the nose we've got main gear doors and they are on there and these ones are so so look at that we've got main gear doors and they are on there and these ones are so fragile these rear ones but we're just gonna leave them alone right there um, so now the front gears that's special because on a real flanker there is just one large front landing gear door that comes down on the right side um, but we've got four we've got four two on either side on this one so that's different um, and once again they don't there's no locators there's nothing we just kind of what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut them and we are gonna glue them directly to either either side of the landing gear bay there okay now I'm not sure where they got this shape for the uh, landing gear doors but we've got them on so now I'll finish the other side and then we're I mean we're really almost almost done with this got a little touching up to do on some of the wheels um, with the flat rubber and uh, I've got to touch up the red around the landing gear doors but then we're gonna be ready for our for our semi-gloss and then we can do some of the small detail painting um, you know bits around we are finished with painting the landing gear doors they're all on we're ready now for our semi-gloss and what I should mention is that then I'm also going to just do a, a flat around the anti-glare panel. And rather than just a, a conventional semi-gloss, normally I use uh, Acryl, Model Master Acryl semi-gloss. I'm just going to use this Vallejo Satin Varnish because I have it right here. And it's going to give us pretty much the same effect. Well, we're at my favorite point where we get to unmask the canopy. And uh, I, you can see I had to patch it a couple a couple places because just through the normal work of building and stuff some of the parafilm started to to wear a little bit here and there but let's see a 
Now remember, we didn't have a very detailed interior to begin with, and I didn't go out of my way to do more with it because we're doing this exactly to the standards of the Rebel kit. So I kind of forgot what we're gonna see in here, but it's, it's not gonna be fantastic. Here we go. Nothing to see in there at all. But we've got nice clean edges and a nice shiny canopy. Okay, about the only thing left to do on this particular model is to add navigation lights and a, uh, a clear to differentiate the lens on the Erstis right here from the rest of the, the housing. So I'm just going to use uh, Acryl Guards Red and I'm going to use Cabalite Green from Citadel. They're just a nice generic red and green that will look good for the nav lights on the right and left. And I've got this, and look, it's been oversprayed by stuff, but I, you know, I haven't gotten to use this yet at all, and I want to use it. So I'm going to use this as the kind of gloss clear coat on the lights and there, and then oh, a little bit of paraffin there to remove. And then we'll see the whole thing finally all, all finished. Well, here it is all done. And yes, I still say the worst looking flanker model you can get. Um, the lines generally still to me look like a hybrid, like a MiG-29 and a Su-27 had a baby. You can see where it has the general proportions, the general shape of, of a flanker, but the proportions are off, some of the details are off. Again, I did this entirely out of the box according to the Ravel directions to build it exactly the way they wanted it. So you're you're gonna see a lot of stuff that you know you, you look at and you're like, that's not that's why did he do it like that? Like for instance, the last step, the nav lights, you know, they shouldn't all be it shouldn't be 180 degree green, but or red, but that's that's what the instructions said to do. The Erstis housing here is just shaped wrong. I mean, but I mean then again look at look at the cockpit. It's just all kinds of wrong, but that's what we got. Looking at the underside, we have our drag bomb, which I'm not sure if that propeller is supposed to spin. It's got angled props on it, so does it spin to slow it down when it drops? I don't know, but we have our uh, we have a total of six hard points, so we have two AA-10 alphas and two uh, well Bravos, I guess, painted the way they said. I really like the painting technique when I tried to do the the black primer and then the white swirls. I think it came out a little bit better on the bottom than on the top, but the colors really do remind me of a MiG-29 kind of fighter. But I am still, again, super impressed with how the decals held up for a kit from 1989. Um, but there it is. My vote for worst flanker ever, ever. I hope you guys enjoyed going on this little adventure with me, putting this thing together and taking a look at it and seeing how it was going to turn out. I'm going to return to some of the other projects I had in the works and scheduled now that this is done, but it will get an honored place on the shelf as something, something special. As I say at the end of every video, for folks building their own stuff at home, keep building them, build them well. For everybody else just likes to watch the videos, we'll be back with another project, continuing with some of our Macross builds and a build for a friend with a somewhere between a real life and a what if P47D. I'll see you guys again real soon.